Ephesians chapter 5. If you want to turn there in your King James Bible, we're going to continue our series here, an expository series on the book of Ephesians. And uh, we're going to start out here in verse 1. It says here, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Okay? Now, you can't be God, but you should obey and follow him in your life. All right? We're supposed to be like Christ, and Jesus Christ is God. All right, you see that there. And um, part of that following there is, uh, you know, that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is our reasonable service. If you read Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. But let's go in your Bible here to 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, verse 14 through 16. Okay, it says here, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts and your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Right. Um, if you are saved, you are a child of God. That means you are part of the heavenly family of God. Uh, the God of the universe is your heavenly Father, in other words. So uh, do you think that you should act like the rest of the people out there, or do you think that you should act somewhat differently from the lost world? Uh, very much differently from the lost world. Very, very important to live a holy life. Okay? Extremely important. <laughs> Go back to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to see some of these things here, these prohibitions that... You're not supposed to live uh, a life of perpetual sin and, and messing around and, and filthiness and whatever else. And of course people say, well then, if I do anything wrong, then I lose my salvation. And uh, No, this, this is talking about the way you're supposed to live your life. We read up there in chapter 4 last week, we read that uh, you're not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God whereby you are sealed. Okay, so you are sealed, you are a part of the family now. And now you're told how you're to live, you're to be holy, and act like you're a child of God. And these are the things that you should avoid. Verse 3, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Now that works two ways. Okay, first of all, you shouldn't name it in the sense of, you shouldn't, it shouldn't be named among you, I should say is what the passage says there. In other words, you shouldn't be guilty of these things here. You shouldn't be, people shouldn't know that, oh yeah, that one guy there, he calls himself a Christian. He's really, you know, well known for being uh, a fornicator or unclean or covetousness. Okay? That sin is not, you're not supposed to be guilty of that sin. But there's another way to look at that. Okay? And that is, you shouldn't be talking about things like this, telling dirty jokes or, or talking about things that lead to fornication and things like that. You shouldn't be unclean in your speech. You shouldn't be given to covetousness. Okay? Very important. Look at verse 4. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater, that's what covetousness leads to, idolatry, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. God, his wrath comes upon the children of disobedience, those people that are lost, and you as a Christian can get into that same kind of punishment from God because you're acting like you're lost. Now, you know, and a lot of people get all worked up with me because I say that you have to be a new creature and there has to be evidence of salvation and of repentance, you know, as part of salvation. And people say, oh, your teaching works, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the fact of the matter is um, 
you can act like you're very much lost uh, as a Christian. And I am very well aware of that. And the reason I preach so hard against this thing of people you know, sinning and living in sin after their supposed salvation is because uh, while you can live like a lost person, I think it's very, very dangerous to just say that everybody out there that per professes to be saved is automatically saved and you shouldn't question it. I question a lot of people's salvation just simply to get them to examine themselves to see whether they're in the faith. Um, but do I believe that a Christian can mess around with sin? Absolutely. Absolutely, yes, I do. I have, to be very honest. I have. I've, I've messed around with things that I know are wrong and... and you know, you say, well, you're still doing it? No, I clean it up. Get rid of it. That's what the exhortation is here in this passage. But um, you say, well, uh, what about verse 4, Brian? Or, there it says about neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. So in other words, we're not supposed to joke? Is that what the passage is saying? No, it's not saying you shouldn't ever laugh or you shouldn't say anything funny or, or whatever. That's not what it's saying there. Look what it says. Foolish talking, nor jesting. What, is, what comes to your mind when you think of a jester, a court jester, a court fool, somebody that's doing foolish things and acting, you know, very, you know, ridiculously? Uh, we're not supposed to do that as Christians. We're to be sober, the Bible says. Okay, we are not to be just acting like a fool. But um, again, you see the thing of the sexual sins there. A whoremonger is somebody that is living in perpetual fornication, living with somebody like that, not in a marriage commitment type of a relationship there. Unclean person. And of course, the covetous man, that's very interesting because it says, who is an idolater? Now, what is covetousness? Covetousness is wanting something that you don't have and that you don't need. Okay, it's not the same as some guy saying, I really am uh, you know, wanting to have um, something to eat because I haven't eaten in days, you know, and I'm just really thinking about food or something. That's not being covetous. Covetous is saying, I have a house, but I want a bigger house. And that's all you think about. I just, I gotta, I just gotta have a bigger house. I, not because you need one, but because you want one. I have a nice vehicle that runs and gets me from point A to point B, but I need a bigger one, and a nicer one. See, covetousness is when you are not content with what you have. That's what covetousness uh, is. And I'll tell you one of the quickest ways to become covetous is to look a lot at catalogs. Um, I used to have a really hard time with that. Uh, I'd get some kind of an outdoors type catalog, a Cabela's catalog or some kind of thing like that and, and uh, I'd look at it and I'd start thinking, well, you know, I really should have a, another gun for hunting or for whatever. Or I really should have that new hunting knife there. That, that really looks good and, and, you know, and it would start to consume my thoughts and I'd start to say to myself, oh yeah, what was I, what was I doing? Oh, well, maybe I could look that up online. Maybe I could look at new whatever up online. It starts to become an idol. And you end up starting to look more and think more about that than you do about the Word of God or about witnessing or whatever. It starts to lead to idolatry. You start to idolize things. You know, people think of idolatry, they think of some little statue sitting there, some little false god sitting there or whatever, people bowing down to it. That doesn't have to be that way. Idolatry, you know, I heard an old saying there, the, the desire of your heart is your God. That's very true. The thing that you think most about, the thing that you are concerned most with, that is your God. That is your idol. It's a challenge. But let's go next here to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You can keep your hand there in Ephesians chapter 5 because we'll be coming back here. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Of course, another way to do that is you know, if you have a little bookmark or some kind of a thing, a piece of paper or whatever, you can keep there in Ephesians chapter 5 because since it's 
since it's an expository study, we, we will be coming back there quite a bit here. But uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28 through 32. Okay, it says here, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. So when you see there in Ephesians chapter 5, where it talks about um, the, the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience, be not ye therefore partakers with them. Over here, it defines it and says, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. So Ephesians chapter 5 is not saying that you will be their partakers with the children of disobedience. In other words, you lose your salvation and go to hell. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is you will be chastened of the Lord, but not condemned with the lost world. Okay, scripture with scripture is how the thing works. But now let's go back to Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. Here it says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Uh, yes, there does need to be some works meet for repentance there after salvation. There is, needs to be some proof that somebody truly did get saved, that they are a child of light. Okay, very important there. 1 John chapter 1 you can head over there, 1 John chapter 1. First John chapter 1, starting at verse 5. It says here, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you, that God is light. So we're children of light, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. You say, okay, then the verse there is saying, if we say that we are the child, children of God, then we should be sinless, right? Keep reading. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Okay, walking as a child of light. What is light? Light is something that exposes. Okay, if something is dark, I have a little flashlight here. If it's dark and I shine that light at you, okay, I mean, what did that just do? Did you see darkness there? No, you saw light. Now, if we're in a dark area, you know, right now you really don't need me shining that light in your face. It's kind of annoying, isn't it? <laughs> but if we're in a dark place, you'd want me to have this light, wouldn't you? Yeah. And you see, as a Christian, when you are starting to live like the world, the world is in darkness, you start to live like the world, and the Lord says, uh, why don't you open up my word there? Let me give you a little bit of light because you are a child, a child of light. And you open up the scriptures and it says, thou shalt not covet. Oh, hmm. you know, uh, Lord, I'd really like to have that brand new bass boat that's out there. And the Lord says, uh, you ever hear the thing about covetousness? Oh, well, um, I guess I don't need it, do I? And the Lord says, no, you don't need that. Yeah, it's like a, a parent, you know, a child comes to him and says, you know, I need that new bicycle. What's wrong with the one that you have? Well, it's not as nice as the ones that the children have here in the neighborhood or whatever. You don't need a new bicycle. There's nothing wrong with yours, see? And it's that way with us and the Lord, our relationship with the Lord. And when you have that free will that God allows you to do certain things and whatever else, you will fall into sin. We are prone to sin. Okay? And what happens when you fall into sin is you need to be honest about it. You need to uh, shine the light 
on it. And you need to say, um, the Bible says that this stuff is a sin there. If we read back there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Do your own spanking, in other words. Don't wait and mess around until God has to spank you. All right. And what 1 John, these verses here, verses 5 through 10, what it's all about is self-judging. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But what's the opposite? If we don't confess our sins, He is faithful and just to punish us. Okay? That would be the opposite of what that's, what's going on in that verse. And you say, but how am I supposed to know what's right and wrong? You have a book. God put it in writing. I mean, think about what you have here in this King James Bible. Think about this. The God who created the universe put His laws and His instructions in writing. He didn't do word of mouth. He didn't say, well, I'll tell you what, um, here's what you don't want to do and here's what you don't want to do. Just, you know, pass it along. And it's just been passed down to us, you know, through the years, through oral tradition. Uh, that would get quite, quite corrupted after time, after some time. Now, the King James Bible is based on ancient manuscripts, okay, ancient witnesses that have been around for thousands of years. There is no other historical book that can, that can uh, compare itself to this book in terms of ancient witnesses, the multiple ancient witnesses. They come out with this stuff all the time, cracks me up. You'll hear, oh, this, this ancient scripture, it's like 20,000 years old or something like this. No, it isn't. Give me a break. Well, it says it is. So what? Where are the ancient witnesses to line up with it? Oh, there aren't any. Oh, well, we carbon dated it and stuff. Yeah, and you carbon date living you know, matter, living flesh of animals, and it's like, you know, it says that it's thousands of years old or something. There is no holy scriptures out there. There are no holy scriptures that are older than this King, than the Hebrew and the and the Greek of that line up with the King James Bible. Even the King James Bible itself, over 400 years old now. You know, God has a standard, and it's a book. It's in writing, and you can judge yourself. It is a light. Thy word is a light the Bible talks about. It is a light so that you can judge yourself. And we are children of that light. See, it all lines up. Now let's go back to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Okay, it says here, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Okay, Galatians chapter 5. Keep your hand right there because we're going to be definitely flipping back and forth here. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Okay, it says here, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, But the fruit of the, the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that, have, that, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. You say, wait a second. Here in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, it lists... Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, temperance, or goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Okay, um, there are nine there. But over here in Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, it says, uh, goodness, righteousness, truth. Isn't that a contradiction? No, because see, over here in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, it's describing the individual characteristics of that fruit of the Spirit. Now, I used to make the mistake, and a lot of people make this same mistake. They will actually add to the Word of God innocently. It's not a purposeful, malicious adding to Scripture here, but they will make the mistake of adding an S 
They will say fruits of the Spirit. Why? You see nine things there and you say that's more than one, so it has to be the fruits uh, of the Spirit. But that's not what the text says. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Those are characteristics of one thing. And what is that one thing? The Holy Spirit being in you. The Holy Spirit being in you, there will be these nine characteristics of that fruit of the Spirit. But you see, look over at Ephesians chapter 5, and it says, the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, truth. In other words, those things, goodness, righteousness, and truth, the nine characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit are going to show up when you are living in goodness, righteousness, and following the truth. You see? Over here in Galatians, it's describing the fruit of the Spirit. And over here in Ephesians, it's saying the fruit of the Spirit, those nine characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit are in these things. Goodness, goodness righteousness, and truth. See? That's how the thing works. Now let's look at verse 11 and through 13. It says here, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Interesting because the fruit of the Spirit comes from being a child of light. But if you want to be unfruitful, the fruit of the Spirit's not there, then you mess around with the works of darkness. Okay? Interesting. And notice too it says there that we are to reprove the unfruitful works of darkness. That means that you are supposed to judge wicked things and sin and wicked systems. Don't let anybody ever deceive you into thinking that you have no right to judge other religions or other systems or whatever. Yes, you do, and you have a responsibility. But there is a little bit of a warning attached here. Let's keep reading. Verse 12, For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Again, we see the light there. But notice verse 12, For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Be careful how far you go when you are exposing some of the works of darkness. Um, I sometimes will get a little bit too deep, I think, in, into some of the things of reproving and exposing some things. And sometimes I'm doing it simply because people are so asleep. There's just, if I just kind of say, well, there's some evil things going on, people go, oh, it's not that bad. Come on. And so I show, okay, let me show you a little bit of what this stuff in the occult means or whatever else. But there is a danger in that going too far. You can actually start leading people into sin. Um, if I would, for instance, if I'd make a, a video coming out against child porn pornography and I would show some imagery or something like that there, I don't need to do that. Um, there's this uh, Joe Schimmel guy. I was, I've been, had a brother send me a video that he's now coming out against the pre-trib rapture, typical. But uh, this guy, um, he had a whole series of videos called They Sold Their Soul for Rock and Roll. And I've seen parts of it, and, you know, he shows that the rock industry is definitely openly satanic. But the whole thing is I come away from the video feeling vexed. It's supposed to be a Christian video, but he ends up showing all the wickedness and the filth and everything else. And I'm going, you know, you're defiling my mind with your documentary. I mean, we're watching all these satanic movies and videos and all this other stuff, and it's just like, I don't need to see all this stuff. You know, be careful how far you go into that thing of exposing the evil. You know, um, <clears throat> I'd like to eventually, and I keep saying about this, but, you know, there's copyright issues that I'm, that I'd have to deal with here, but um, showing the mind control and brainwashing behind uh, television. But, you know, I've been praying about that thing for a while, and it's like, should I even do the thing? Because I'm going to have to show some stuff from television. I'm going to have to show some examples of mind control and whatever else. And so I ended up, am I going too far? You know, am I, am I disobeying verse 12 there? It is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. So I don't know. That's, that's something that, I mean, 
the Bible is very, very simple when it comes to instructions about wickedness and evil. It's just like, stay away from it, flee from it, get away from it, you know. So th those verses there, you have to weigh that thing out. But verse 13 says, All things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. So, yes, you should expose certain things and certain movements. It is there. Just don't go too far. That's what the Bible is saying. <clears throat> now go to verse 14 here. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspe circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Very, very, very important here. Extremely important. Okay. What group of people out there are described as fools in the Bible? The Bible plainly teaches, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And you can live like an atheist as a saved Christian. So what are you talking about? There are a lot of people that are saved Christians, and yet they act like an atheist with many things. They do things without reference to God. They, don't, they do things without referring to the Word of God. They don't, they don't live by the, the precepts of Scripture. And you get a lot of professing Christians that are out there, and I, I just say professing because I don't know for sure if they're even saved, but you get a lot of these people, and it's just like, <clears throat> you say, boy, we are like really living in the end times. I mean, the Lord's got to be taking us out of here at any minute. And they go, oh, I don't know. I don't think it's that bad. Huh? Are you kidding me? Redeeming the time because the days are evil. When you are convinced of how evil this world is, when you, when you see how bad things really are getting, you'll be like, man, you know, this world is not my home. I got to, you know, do whatever I can to help the rapture come about. You know, let's get people saved and so we can get out of here. I mean, this, this is bad. You know, even from a scientifically verifiable, I mean, we're talking faith here, the thing of people getting saved and believing the Lord's going to come and all that. <clears throat> Excuse me. But even from a scientifically, you know, observable standpoint, I mean, look at what's going on with the environment. You know, you have Fukushima over in Japan there that's just getting hit all the time and it's spilling all the radioactive material into the ocean. You know, there's huge amounts of, of discarded plastic in the Pacific Ocean. I saw a thing on that that the ocean is just filled with, with garbage. You know, the Pacific Ocean is a big, big ocean. <laughs> and it's just filled with radioactive material, with plastic, with all this stuff. The oil spilled, never was cleaned up. I mean, it's just like, it's, it's insane. The environmental uh, horror that's coming. And I mean, I, watching the thing on the thing of geoengineering, and these mad scientists have messed with the atmosphere and, and, I mean, it's literally destroying the earth. These guys have destroyed the earth. And just incredible. If God doesn't intervene, this earth isn't going to be here in another hundred years. It's just as simple as that. I mean, it's, it's that bad. You know, and you say, what does that mean, Ryan? Well, redeeming the time because the days are evil. I'm not going to say, oh, another hundred years from now, you know, uh, someday maybe I'll be sitting on my front porch when I'm 90 years old, you know, and I have children and grandchildren and all this other stuff. That ain't going to happen. I mean, I'd be shocked if I'll be here in another four or five years. I would be shocked. Okay. The way things are progressing, it's just insane. But uh, <clears throat> turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Throat's kind of given out on me here. <clears throat> First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4 through 11. And again, notice the distinction here between the lost and the saved. Those who are in darkness, those who are in the light. Look at this. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light. 
and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. See? Not like a fool. Don't act like a fool, like a jesting, somebody that's jesting. <clears throat> Verse 7, For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. How would it be a comfort to say, not only is the environment falling apart, not only is man waxing worse and worse, but guess what, Christian? You're going to face God's wrath for seven years. Huh? Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's not a comfort. That's a terror. That's horrible. What is the comfort? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. See? The blessed hope. We call it the rapture. That is your comfort, knowing that as things are getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, God's not going to leave his children here. Okay? He's going to come and take us away. I think I said about this in one of my other studies, but, you know, it'd be kind of like some guy in the military and he's given orders, you know, I want you to destroy this town. This town has a lot of bad people in it and there's a whole kinds of horrible things going on in there and the guy says but wait a second my wife and children are in that town right now they're in there at some kind of a appointment or some kind of a place or whatever else I'm not going to destroy that town until I get my wife and children out and his commander says oh, okay go ahead and he says I'm going in there he goes in and gets his wife and children out now all that's left is the evil wicked people What's he do? Bombs away. <laughs> That's what the Lord's going to do. He is not going to, I mean, think about it. We're in Christ. We're children of light. And he's going to pour out his judgment and wrath upon us along with the lost. It's not consistent with Scripture. There's never been one time when God has judged and poured out wrath on people that are just. Okay? I didn't say that he's not allowed the wicked to persecute those that are just and righteous. That's there. But that's not the time of Jacob's trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, opening the seals. You know, pouring out the vials blowing the trumpets, the angels blowing the trumpets there. It's God pouring out wrath and judgment on the earth. And there's never been one time. I mean, think about that. Here you are, you're doing right, you're living right and everything else, and God's like, I'm pouring out judgment on you. You get up to heaven and you say, what was that all about? Lord, I, why did you pour out your wrath and judgment on me? I wasn't doing anything wrong. I'm part of your body. Why would you do that? not consistent. It's not what the Bible teaches. Now, hey, the Roman Catholic Church takes over America and they're getting close too, you know, like I did in a recent video there a couple weeks ago, um, talked about that Obama has appointed this Jesuit priest as the head of religious freedom, you know, office of religious freedom. It's like, yeah, right. You know, the Catholics are getting more and more power here in America. Could there be some Catholic persecution coming to Bible believers before the rapture? I don't know. Definitely possible. But it's, it's not God that's saying, I'm bringing the Catholics in to, to pour out wrath on these wicked Bible-believing Christians. That isn't it at all. And by the way, the thing that will keep those wicked Catholics away from us is if we continue to stand for the truth. All right? 
when you start to back down and you start to give in to the wickedness and everything else, then yeah, God will allow you to be punished. But he himself will not come in and pour out his wrath on saved people that are doing right and that are living right. Now go back to Ephesians verse 5 or Ephesians chapter 5, excuse me, verse 17. Okay, it says here, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine, wherein it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Okay, now let me just make a little statement here. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Is it wrong for a Christian to drink wine? No. Paul tells Timothy to drink a little bit of wine for his stomach's sake and for his often infirmities. Okay, um, When you have fermented types of things, you, there's a whole lot of different ways that you can ferment things. You can ferment uh, cabbage. You get sauerkraut. You can ferment uh, grape juice you know, with the right process, and you'll get a wine. Okay, And there are things when you do fermentation. Uh, there's lacto-fermentation where you use whey. It comes from milk. Um, you let milk sit, raw milk, not store-bought milk, because if you've seen my video on that, you can let store-bought milk sit for months and it doesn't go bad. But if you use raw milk, it will. raw milk doesn't technically go bad. It changes. Okay, It, it actually will form into something else. In other words, it will separate into cheese, like a, like a cream cheese, and into a liquid called whey. It's kind of a light... A watery kind of a, a liquid. That way you can use to do lacto fermentation. You can ferment all kinds of things. And what happens is the good bacteria that's in raw milk will actually change the characteristics of things, help them to be preserved. Ancient cultures would have done that before refrigeration. You would need different ways to preserve your food because when you have a big harvest, you can't just say, well, we got to eat everything before it goes bad. That doesn't work. Um, so you have canning techniques. You have lacto-fermentation, and when you ferment with good bacteria, it actually becomes that much healthier. And so there's a lot of that type of thing there. But with something like wine, you can actually, you know, if there's excess, which you see right there in the verse, you will get drunk. And drunkenness is condemned in Scripture. Why? Well, isn't it interesting that we just read over there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, they that sleep, you know, sleep in the night, and they that are drunk are drunken in the night. See, lost people get drunk. The smart ones do. You know why? To escape reality. I mean, you know, okay, let's just say the Bible's not true. What hope would there be for this world? It'd scare you out of your mind if you're really truly looking at reality. If you're escaping reality through living in television world or, or fantasy world or whatever else, well then, you know, you probably aren't going to be caring too much. But the reason a lot of that lost world, the reason they party, the reason they get drunk out of their minds is because they know what's going on and they know what's coming. So they have to resort to drunkenness. You know, I, I remember hearing Dr. Ruckman saying years ago, and it's very, very true, he said, there's only three options for somebody who's smart in this world. Somebody who's intelligent, has brains that actually work, you know, that they're using. Number one, when you see what's going on in this world, it should convince you to get saved. Number two, you see what's going on in this world and you don't want to get saved, then you better get drunk and stay drunk. And just destroy your mind so that you don't understand what's coming. Or number three, kill yourself. Those are the only three options for you if you really understand what's going on in this world and really understand what's coming to this world. Mega earthquakes and, and environmental catastrophe and everything else. This world's dying. Those are your three options. Get saved, get drunk, kill yourself. The only three options. You say, well, a lot of people don't do any of those three because they don't have much brains. That's why. But... Getting back to what I was saying, drinking wine is not wrong, but there's the appearance of evil, 
What are you doing walking into that alcohol store? You see, I'm just going for one bottle of wine. Does the lost world know that? See, there's that problem. Can you trust yourself knowing that this alcohol uh, can make you, can dull some of your pain? Is there a possibility there that you might abuse that and start to mess around with drunkenness? See, you have to be careful about that. And uh, for a while now, um, just a couple weeks actually, well, maybe a couple months now, I guess, uh, my wife and I will occasionally make new wine. You say, you drink wine? Let me explain. New wine, the Bible talks about, you can look up this reference, I don't have it written here, but new wine is in the cluster. Okay, all new wine is, is it's grape juice. You say, well, you know, you can get that at the store. Well, here again, not to open up another can of worms, so to speak, but uh, most store-bought Grape juice is actually from concentrate. In other words, it's heated. It's pasteurized. And so there's a lot of nutritional things, a lot of, a lot of uh, raw qualities of that fruit which are killed when you heat it. So what we do is we go to the store and, and we have an old juice strainer we got on eBay the one time, a Victorio strainer, and has a little hopper, and then you put your fruit down in the top and then you turn a little crank and it's all non-electric type of thing and goes through this little thing comes out through a screen and down this little ramp and you put a bowl there and then you put a bowl at the other end where the seeds and the skin comes out and uh, it's, it's amazing the taste of real true grape juice that's not been heated uh, it's really really good and very good for you and um, you say well it takes a lot of work yeah it does and it's it's you know something that's not very cheap because uh, you have to buy the raw fruit and things that concord grapes is what we use but uh, little things like that once in a while you know it's good for you so and you can use you know to make other types of juices and things as well and there are juicers that you can get all kinds of stuff like that again I'm not going to go off on a big tangent there but um, it's perfectly fine to you know drink uh, things like that, you know, but I personally stay away from anything alcoholic just simply because it's the appearance of evil. And secondly, there's always going to be the temptation there to abuse it. So I do drink new wine, you know, from the cluster, smashing the grapes, you know, but I don't mess around with, and I mean, I guess you could do it the old fashioned way too, of just, you know, putting the grapes in a container and stepping on it with your bare feet. Make sure they're clean first. <laughs> But, you know, wine, I just tend to stay away from it, the alcoholic stuff. But let's look here at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. First Corinthians chapter 8. Verses 9 through 13. Says here, but take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. That's another big reason that I stay away from alcohol. Um, I don't recommend that drinking alcohol simply because I know that there are some of you out there that have been former alcoholics. And to you, it's a great temptation to fall back into sin. Again, that sin of drinking and drunkenness, I should say drunkenness. You know, that's why the only thing I would ever drink is New wine, grape juice, essentially. Okay, uh, so again, keep that in mind. But let's continue here. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Question. 
what kind of music do you sing? You say, well, brother, I, I have a good collection of hymns and think I didn't ask that. So, oh, oh, well, then you meant MP3 files on my MP3 player. I didn't ask that. That's not what the verse says, brother, in there. It says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. How often do you sing? You say, brother, I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. Why on earth would I poison the air with my horrible voice? <laughs> um, because God wants to hear it. Hmm. And you know, uh, my wife and I used to be in the habit of, we had, we have a couple of hymn books around, you know, and stuff, and we would just get the hymn books and we would, you know, sing a couple of hymns before we'd go to sleep. I know the, that was a practice of the old time Methodists. They would sing hymns before they went to sleep and when they get up in the morning, every day. Seven days a week, 365 days a year. And you know what's good about that? There's a lot of good doctrine in the old hymns and you're keeping it in your mind and, and, and whatever. And I'll tell you what, if you live any time, you know, any kind of normal life here in, in this world, you're going to go places and you're going to hear the world's music. And it is very vexing. I mean, I remember back when I was a kid, you'd go into a grocery store and there, there was either no music playing or very soft, soothing music. Now you go into the, the grocery stores and you're hearing classic rock and you're hearing Britney Spears and all kinds of, and I'm just like, uh, you know, I just feel like walking into the store with, with ear protection on or something like this. Just like, it's disgusting. You know what helps with that? If you have hymns in your mind. I mean, maybe, you know, I, I remember a brother was telling me the one time an a older friend of mine, he was saying that uh, he went into this pizza shop the one time and they had uh, rock music playing and, you know, kind of not real loud, but playing in the background and stuff. And, and he went in to pick up a few pizzas, you know, takeout type of a thing. And they said, oh, you know, I'll be ready in, in just a few minutes, a little while. And so he was like, okay. He's like, well, that's not a problem. I'll just wait here, you know. And he started, you know, just kind of walking around in the right there near the pizza, the counter or whatever. And he's and he started singing, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You know, <laughs> and he, they're all Italian Catholics, you know, back there making the pizza. And he said, you know, it, it got the pizzas ready that much quicker. <laughs> you know, they're just like, get the pizza ready. Get this guy out of here, you know. And uh, just kind of funny. And, you know, you don't have to do it that way. I mean, some of us are a little bit more bold than others. I mean, that's not a problem. But, you know, you ought to keep the hymns in your mind. You ought to keep Christian music in your mind. And as you're walking around or walking through nature or driving to work or whatever, sing some hymns. Even if you don't know the lyrics, just hum the hymn or whistle the hymn or whatever. You know, why? You're knowing it unto the Lord. That's what it says there. It's very important. And I know we have the technology now and everything else. I mean, you get these little sand disc uh, clip thingies, you know, and stuff. I mean, we have a, a couple of them here and we'll put the Bible on them and things. And we have, uh, you know, most of my sermons, I convert them to audio file and then we, we listen to them and, and things like that. Just, you know, I check and recheck and make sure I'm teaching the right doctrine. And, you know, you can clip them on your shirt and you put your headphones on while you're out in the yard or doing this or doing that. And a lot of times you start to rely too much on that technology, you know. And what was happening with me especially is I'm starting to forget the tunes to the old hymns. I'm starting to forget the words of the old hymns. Because, you know, you get a lot of these, a lot of CDs and things like that. They'll sing the first and the, and the last line of the hymn. What about the other verses? See, you start forgetting. And I know there, again, you know, I, I knew of a, a guy there, uh, Mitch Knup, I have his videos back, you know, probably two years ago now. And uh, I remember him saying that there was actually a project somebody was working on and they were going to bring out the old hymns as they were originally written. And some of these old hymns, they'll have 10, 15 verses. And you look at a modern hymn book, there's only four of those verses there. 
we've forgotten quite a bit of the old hymns. You know? And it's interesting there, too. It says about speaking to yourselves in psalms. You know a lot of the psalms back in your Bible here, back in the Old Testament, a lot of those psalms were meant to be sung. Hmm. Very interesting. I mean, there's, there's so many things there we get into. I'm not going to go off on a big tangent here. But it's very important there for you to sing to the Lord. And it says there in verse 20, giving thanks always for all things. The Bible elsewhere says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Giving thanks, being thankful. And you know, it's a lot easier to do that when you're singing praises to God. You know, you get stressed out because you're in a traffic jam, start singing a hymn. You get stressed out because something bad is happening or you get, you get fearful because you're kind of scared or whatever and you start to sing a hymn, it'd be a lot easier to give thanks to the Lord. Keep that in mind. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 24. Let's read that. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Christ is the head of the church, not the IRS, by the way. You know I had to put that in there. Verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Okay? Now, let me ask you a question. The church is subject unto Christ. Does Christ make mistakes? No. So let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. You say, wait a second. My husband makes mistakes. If you're a wife, you know that. You've seen times when your husband has really messed up and he hasn't acted Christ-like. You say, well, then how does this work? What does this... How do, how do I do this thing? What is your responsibility as a wife? To tear down your own house? Or to build your husband up? Your responsibility as a wife is to make your husband more like Christ. And part of that is submitting to understanding what the Lord wants for us and understanding what the Lord has for us and saying, I want to help my husband to be in line with that will. And so when my husband's doing right, I'm going to praise him. And I'm going to submit to that and say, praise the Lord, husband. That's good. Thank you. But when my husband gets weak and he falls, and all of a sudden you see him watching television, or all of a sudden you see him doing this or doing that or these other bad things, you say, hmm. And you come and you say, um, honey, uh, can I talk to you about something? Don't come in and say, Hey, you foolish man, let me tell you what... No, 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 no. Let me just show you. Husband, doesn't the Bible say such and such? You know? And the husband, you know, hopefully he'll submit himself to the Word of God and change that. You know? Pray about it. And, you know, I know a lot of women, you, you know, there are some women that are, are married to men that are lost, and that's kind of rough. And I know, you know, some of you have gotten saved after, you know, you were married. And, you, you know, the Bible teaches in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that if, if you're, you know, pleased to dwell with your husband there and there, you get along fairly well, you're not supposed to leave him. You don't just say, well, I'm a Christian now and you, you want to get saved? No, I don't want to get saved. Okay, then I'm leaving. You're not supposed to do that. You know, you can dwell with somebody who's lost. You shouldn't, you know, if you're, if you're saved right now and single, you shouldn't look for somebody who's lost to be married to because you're going to have problems. You're going to have lots of problems. But there is still a sense in which a woman can follow and, and submit herself to her husband as long as he is submitting himself to the will of God, or to the word of God, I should say, because the will of God would be for him to get saved. But a husband that's a good man providing for his wife, whatever, she should continue to pray for him and continue to witness to him. And as she is doing her part, she'll have a better chance of leading her husband to the Lord. Okay? Uh, the Bible talks about, you know, that, sh that the husband can be won by the chaste conversation of the wife. So, but let's look at uh, verse 25 down through verse 33 here. It says here, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, 
that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Did you know that the husband is supposed to bathe his wife? You say, huh? huh what, you, what did you say? Washing of water by the word. Husbands are supposed to teach the wife the word of God. Doesn't mean that the wife can't find things in scripture on her own. That's not at all true. But a husband is regularly supposed to keep this book in the home and make sure that there are devotions, make sure that people are reading the Word of God and living by the Word of God. It's very important, extremely important. The husband is the head of that household. So it's very important for us husbands. I mean, when my wife and I, when we got married, our marriage ceremony, we read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 down through verse 33 as our marriage vows is what we did. And, you know, when you start out there, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And, you know, women go, you know, the, the modern woman mindset, the modern female mindset is kind of like, well, submit myself. It starts out, I'm going to have to submit myself to him, you know. Yeah. But look at it. You have verse 22, verse 23, verse 24. Three verses for the women. Then you have verse 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33. Nine verses for the man. So a husband has three times as much responsibility in that marriage as the wife does. And let me tell you something, husbands. If things are going wrong in your home, it's your fault. You say, well, no, it's not me. I'm doing right. My wife just, she won't submit herself to me. Why not? Is it because you're not living like Christ? See, we're supposed to live like Christ. We're supposed to be strong leaders in the home. Hey, if, you, if this book doesn't have a prominent place in your home, if you aren't reading this Bible and living by this Bible and you're bringing the television into the home and allowing the world's music to come into the home, all these other enemies and things like that, if that's happening, it's your fault, husband. Things start to go wrong. If you're removing this book, that's the reason. If this book doesn't have a prominent place in your daily life, things are going to start to fall apart. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. I have seen that thing happen. But let's continue. Verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Hmm. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. See, that feminist movement that's out there in the world today was a satanic trap perpetra perpetrated by the devil to get wives to turn against their husbands. And one of the quickest ways that that can happen is through careerism. A wife goes out and she's out there in the workforce and she's like, I can make my own money, I'm able to survive without my husband and all this other stuff. You know, and, and you know, again, brethren, I understand a lot of the reasons why you know, sisters in Christ will get into the careerism thing and stuff like that. I understand that there are financial difficulties. I understand that there are areas of this country where you can't live uh, very well with the type of money that most people make. And you have to, you know, you have to rationalize the dual income thing and all this other. I understand, okay? Satan is, is too intelligent to just say women should be in the workforce and then, and then not make any reasons why they should be there. Okay, I understand that you can get yourself into a real big mess as a Christian woman, as a Christian couple. Okay, I understand that. I understand that there are people that have really gotten themselves into the system and it's 
um, very difficult, if not impossible, to get back out of it again. Okay, I'm not justifying it. I'm not saying it's okay for women to be in the workforce and everything else. But we have gone so far away from where the Lord originally intended us to be. I mean, you go back two, three hundred years ago, you know, a lot of, and you pull away a lot of the modern conveniences, women were forced to stay at home because they had to cook, they had to clean, they had to do all these things like that. But now our modern conveniences get us more into debt. So now you have to have that extra income and all this other stuff. It's a real mess that we're in. Is it possible for a woman to be a keeper at home and not be in the workforce today, right now? Yes, it is. You say, well, Brother Brian, we, just, we couldn't afford our place if we well, then move to a different area. You know, you can get still get some pretty cheap housing out there. You can still move to some pretty cheap areas. All right, it's still available. It's still out there. And it will require some serious sacrifices. It certainly will. You know, is it worth it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, it is worth it doing the biblical way. Staying out of debt. The wife being a keeper at home. The husband being the one that earns the money. It is worth it. But uh, interesting there, verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Speaking of verse 31 there, about a man leaving his father and mother and joining unto his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. Now, as I said <clears throat> before, you know, the Bible teaches that there is one body of Christ, and we are members of that body. We are children of God, but we are also members of the body of Christ. Okay, And when you get saved, you leave your worldliness there. You leave your old father and mother, the world there, you know, your father being Satan before you're saved, and the mother being kind of like Mother Earth. <laughs> you leave your father and mother, and you join yourself unto Christ. And the two of you become one. And you see, what you do affects what a wife does, I should say. What a wife does affects her husband. That's why it's very important for the wife to see that she reverence her husband. That's why it's important for you to live the right kind of life. And I mean, this study here, verse 22 through 33, is almost a whole different thing in and of itself. And I don't know if I'm ever going to get around to doing that, uh, going through all the different responsibilities that Christian wives and husbands have with each other and things there. Like I said, very, very detailed. But I'm just trying to hit kind of the high points right now. You know, there's an old um, saying that I was told years and years ago, and that is that the perfect Christian marriage is like a triangle. Okay, the Lord is at the top of the triangle, and the wife is down here, the husband's there. And their goal is to get closer to the Lord. And as they go up that triangle, closer to the Lord, they're getting closer to the Lord, but they're also getting closer to each other, you see. And the closer you get to the Lord, the closer you get to each other. And that's a very good illustration. Okay, and the wife is to reverence her husband and to try and make him as much like Christ as possible. The husband is supposed to say, I need to wash my wife and also my children. I need to keep my household under the authority of the King James Bible, the Word of God. I need to have the Word of God have a prominent place in our home. And singing hymns together and things, don't worry about your voices being off-key and whatever else. And you know, You're singing to the Lord. Okay? But keeping the Bible in a prominent place around the home is very, very important. Uh, another thing that we do here at the ministry headquarters is um, we'll print out or write out scriptures and we put them on the walls. You know, here's a verse there, you know, and, uh, you know, things like that. Keeping the Word of God in a prominent place in your home, you know, that's very, very important. And... Uh, Wives, when you see your husband falling and when you see your husband messing up as a Christian, do your best to help him up. Don't come down on him. Don't judge him. Don't tear him down and say, ah, you really messed up there. Don't do that. That's not helping the situation. 
the best thing that you can do at that point is to say, to restore him and to say, help him to be, get back on track. You know, sometimes I'll forget to, to read the Bible or whatever and, you know, I, I'm just got something on my mind and I'm talking about something I get to, to go on and my wife will say, um, are you forgetting something? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, well, there, uh, and she's like, looks over at the Bible. And, oh, yeah. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I totally forgot about that. Well, you know, and, and there have been times I've been like, well, you know, we're really busy. And she's like, doesn't matter. We need to read the Bible. You know, and, I, and that doesn't happen all the time. It just happens occasionally. Helping each other. The way to have a happy, happy, successful marriage is to keep the Lord in it. Okay? So that's going to be it for this week. One more chapter to go next week, and then we will be, we will be done with Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, this expository study. So let's close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just uh, thank you so much for the challenge from your word. Um, the, just the challenge to stay away from foolish jesting, and covetousness, to remember that we are children of the light. And um, we are not to live like the fools out there, Lord, that, that live without reference uh, to you and to your word. We are to redeem the time, Lord, because the days are evil. And I thank you, Lord, that we do have the promise of leaving before your judgment comes upon this earth, Lord, and then we will be coming back to a planet that is restored. And you're going to take care of all the environmental catastrophe, all the, all the damage, Lord, to this earth. It seems so impossible, and it is impossible for man to clean it up, but, Lord, we know that you can restore this earth back to pristine mint condition. And um, I thank you, Lord, for that promise. And I just pray, Lord, for the married couples out there that, uh, and the families that they would keep your word in a prominent place within the home and the most prominent place within the home and that they would learn to, to sing hymns and uh, not be embarrassed about that, Lord, but just to sing hymns to you for your praise and your glory. And Lord, if there are any single people out there listening to this, Lord, I pray that they would uh, really, really be sure before they enter into a marriage um, make sure that they marry the right person and not compromise and, and think that uh, base things off of the flesh, but that they would make sure that, the, that there's a spiritual connection there, that the other person is saved. Um, I just pray all these things, Lord, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. That will be it for this week. Uh, like I said, join us in next week for the final chapter in the book of Ephesians. And um, Ephesians chapter 6 definitely has some very interesting things in it. So uh, we will end it here and we will see you next week in next week's study. Thank you very much for watching.